Hello, welcome back to our YouTube channel today. I'm thrilled to take you on an action crime drama series from 2017 called The Punisher. Season 1 spoilers ahead. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. No, 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 no! Wait, 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 wait! Just wait! they take him? Uh, I don't know anything. Fair enough. The series begins with a former Marine whose name is Frank Castle. He had a peaceful life with his wife and kids until someone killed them. Since then, haunting memories of their murder won't let him be. His first move was to travel the country and take down gang members linked to his family's death. Did anyone else make it? Oh shit, I'm the only one left. <laughs> the bikers, the cartels, the kitchen Irish, they're all gone. I got a family of my own. I don't. <laughs> oh god. You believe that? Get a room, you dirty bastards. He earns the nickname The Punisher. Once he's done, he stages his death, fading away from the world. Now, six months later, Frank's keeping a low profile in New York City, going with the name Pete Castiglione. He works at a construction site in Brooklyn. His days are about demolishing walls with a sledgehammer, a way to let out his boiling rage. Not everyone's a fan though, especially Lance, a co-worker who's losing overtime because of Frank. Lance messes with Frank, ruins his lunch, and even throws threats his way. Surprisingly, Frank doesn't hit back. In the mix of co-workers, there's Donnie. He attempts to befriend Frank by sharing lunch and opening up about his parents' death. When Donnie discovers Frank's marine past, he tries chatting. Frank, however, makes it clear he's not the person Donnie's seeking. After some work, Frank takes a break at the construction site and overhears Lance and his buddy, Polly, discussing a heist on a poker game guarded by the Natchi crime family. When they catch wind that Frank has heard their conversation, they warn him to stay out of it. Frank remains silent, brushing off their threats. Before they can escalate, their attention shifts to a friend who's injured at the site. Rather than lending a hand, Frank simply looks away. With their friends sidelined due to injury, Polly and Lance enlist Donnie for their heist. Eager for some extra cash, Donnie joins the duo and they head to the location of the poker game. That's Boogaloo. Get up, come on, move your ass! Nobody move, nobody! You boys should leave while you can. Shut up, Greaseball. You get what he got. We're all dead. Come on, let's go. Let's go! You really screwed this up, Donald. Both! No! Now exposed, Donnie becomes a target for the Natchez men who can easily track him down. Frustrated at Donnie for jeopardizing their plans, Lance and Polly unleash their anger, beating him mercilessly. Realizing that the nutty gangsters will sooner or later find them, they decide to end Donnie's life so he cannot give up their names. Donnie attempts to fight back, but the trio overpowers him, tossing him into the concrete mix. Just as Lance prepares to finish the job, Frank appears behind them. He demands Lance shut off the mixer, but when Lance refuses, a brawl ensues. Tonight just gets better and better. <coughs> yeah! Please, just let me go, man. Take the money. Take the money, man. No! Talk. Lanello's in Little Italy. I'm gonna find a home for this. No! Help! No one sleeps until we get these guys. Start with this kid, Donald Chavez. Christ. Frank emerges from the shadows and swiftly takes down the leader with a gunshot. On the other hand, there's special agent Dina Madani. She's back in New York City after a stint in Afghanistan. Her primary focus is the murder of her partner, Zubair, an Afghan national police officer. 
Dinah suspects that U.S. soldiers were involved in heroin trafficking, and when Zubair uncovered it, they silenced him. She tries convincing special agent in charge Carson Wolf, but he dismisses the case as off-limits. Undeterred, Dinah turns to her new partner, Sam Stein, for assistance. She urges him to dig into files about Colonel Schoonover, the explosion and drug bust at the docks last year, and everything related to one of Schoonover's men, Frank Castle. Although Sam believes the Punisher is dead, Dinah finds it hard to believe that Frank and Schoonover died within New York City limits, just 20 miles from each other. Meanwhile, as Frank exits the basement, an unidentified person is seen analyzing gate recognition on camera footage of Frank. The man identifies himself as Micro and drops Frank's real name, revealing he knows Frank is alive. During their conversation, Frank discovers that Microchip is the one who anonymously left a disc at his house, containing footage of Zubair being killed by the U.S. Army. Frank proposes a face-to-face -face meeting, but Microchip insists that Frank must first recognize they're not enemies. Observing a light from a nearby building, Frank swiftly heads to the rooftop. Upon investigation, he finds a mirror and a flashlight creating the beam of light. Worried, Frank pays a visit to his friend, Curtis Hoyle, a former Navy corpsman and insurance salesman, the only person aware of his survival. Frank confides in him about Micro and discloses that Micro claims to possess crucial answers. Micro's sudden re-entry into his life prompts Frank to reflect on whether his family met their demise due to his own mistakes. Now, Frank believes that Micro might hold the key to unraveling these questions. In his quest for information on Micro, Frank turns to his trusted friend and lawyer, Karen Page. He briefs her on Micro's existence and seeks her assistance in locating the mysterious figure. Micro hinted that he's not the only ghost in New York, implying he also faked his death. Armed with Micro's name, Frank locates his residence and orchestrates a plan. He intentionally places himself in front of Micro's wife, Sarah's car, and pretends to get injured. To make it look real, he uses a razor to lacerate his forehead. Distraught, Sarah invites him inside to tend to his wound. Amid their conversation, Sarah recounts her husband's death. Unbeknownst to Sarah, Micro has strategically placed hidden cameras throughout the house to keep tabs on his family. Witnessing Frank's presence with Sarah, Micro panics. He suspects that his wife's life is in danger. He rushes home and waits outside. Observing a broken headlight on Sarah's car, Frank helps in fixing it. Instead of harming Micro's family, Frank provides assistance, allowing Micro to retreat to his hideout without exposing himself. Later that night, Frank shaves his beard and alters his gait to avoid detection through gait recognition technology, ensuring Micro remains unaware of his whereabouts. In a covert move, he then infiltrates Carson Wolf's residence, confronts him, and subjects him to a beating before securing him to a chair. Look, Lieberman was a traitor. He was selling secrets. The way I see it, there's no way a guy like you kills a suspect in a case that big. No way. Whatever you think. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Get on your knees. Tonight's the night you're gonna die, Frank. We knew exactly where you'd be. Exactly where to go to get you. What are you saying? You killed my family to get to me. Misdirection. It was a calculated risk. You understand, right? Now close your eyes, Frank. I'm gonna do you a favor. Guns empty, asshole. No, I don't! Show me in the truth now. The next day, Frank sits in a diner and receives a call from Micro. Micro's first question revolves around why Frank visited his house. Frank responds that Micro chose to put his family in jeopardy by crossing paths with the wrong person. With the stern warning, Frank directs Micro to meet him at a cemetery. Upon Micro's arrival at the designated location, he encounters Curtis instead of Frank. Curtis relays the message that Frank has canceled the meeting and issues a stern warning. If Micro continues pursuing Frank, Curtis will retaliate by going after Sarah. Disheartened, Micro returns to his hideout only to be surprised by Frank, who had hidden himself in Micro's car trunk. With disbelief, Micro witnesses Frank knocking him unconscious. Upon waking up, Micro begins recounting the harrowing story of the day he encountered Carson Wolf and his man. Sensing trouble, Micro instructed his family to stay in the car no matter what. As Wolf and his men closed in, Micro left the car, hoping to avoid a confrontation. However, Wolf caught up with him near the river. In a desperate attempt to clear his name, Micro shouted that the authorities had the wrong information. Micro's wife, Sarah, arrived at the scene only to witness a gun pointed at her husband. As Micro refused to surrender, Wolf shot him in the chest, causing him to plunge into the river. Miraculously, the bullet struck the cell phone in Micro's shirt pocket, saving his life. 
Micro proceeds to detail the sequence of events leading to his becoming a target for Homeland Security. In a revealing flashback, it is disclosed that Micro received a CD containing footage of Ahmad Zubair's murder. As an analyst, he felt compelled to assess the content. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Micro decided to take action and sent the incriminating material to Dina Madani. This choice made him a target for Homeland Security, particularly for Carson Wolf, who was well aware of Ahmad Zubair's murder. Unexpectedly, a three-minute countdown initiates. Micro discloses that it's a failsafe system. If the countdown reaches zero, all camera feeds will be broadcast to media outlets. To stop it, a code and a retinal scan are required. As Frank is standing close to him, Micro takes the opportunity to inject Frank with a sedative, causing him to lose consciousness. No! Upon waking and realizing that Micro hasn't executed him, Frank questions Micro's motives. In response, Micro attempts to persuade him that they should join forces in exposing the people behind Ahmad Zubair's death and the death of Frank's family. Frank starts recollecting the traumatic events in Afghanistan where they did a mission called Cerberus. <laughs> What are you doing? I'm getting the bullet. Looks to me like we're hiding evidence. Let's go. Frank's squad captured Ahmad Zubair, and a CIA agent known as Orange subjected him to brutal torture to extract information about his knowledge of their heroin operation. The conversations were conducted in Persian, making it evident that none of the squad members were aware of Zubair's innocence or Orange's involvement in drug trafficking. A few days later, Frank and his team receive a mission briefing from Schoonover and Orange. From the start, Frank harbors suspicions about the mission being a trap, but his concerns are dismissed. The mission quickly turns disastrous as Schoonover loses his arm and the team finds themselves under heavy fire. Clear path for an evac. Hang on your mind. What do you want to do, Bill? You want to die here? Cover! Enraged at Orange for still caring about the target, Frank violently attacks Orange, leaving him blind in one eye. In the present day, Micro reveals to Frank that the operation he was part of was entirely off the books. It lacked any official records or approval from the United States Congress, rendering it illegal. Frank agrees to collaborate with Micro, laying down one condition. All the targets must be eliminated without exception or the opportunity for a trial. Micro agrees to Frank's terms. To execute their plan, Frank and Micro require weapons. Micro hacks into the NYPD system and discovers an illegal arms shipment arriving from Greece, with Turk as the buyer. To reach the location, they decide to ambush another gang. If you scream, you die. That's it. You don't have to start. All I want to know is... Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> What are you gonna puke? Not gonna. Hey, do not leave your DNA for the police, all right? Just you get in that van and let's go. What about him? Not our problem. Frank and Micro depart the warehouse in two cars. Frank seizes Turk at gunpoint and demands information on the weapons location. However, Turk shatters his plan, revealing that the Greeks are selling the truck to another buyer who's willing to purchase the entire stock. All Turk can offer is a pink gun intended for a gangster's daughter. Disheartened, Frank returns to the hideout and starts cleaning Micro's pistol and the pink gun. Meanwhile, Sam briefs the team on their mission they will be posing as criminal buyers to secure the weapons from the Greeks. Utilizing his hacking skills, Micro identifies the new location of the arms. As night falls, the mission starts with Dina Madani leading. One car tails the truck while other officers, including Sam, wait at the intended destination. Suddenly, their communication systems are compromised and a song starts playing in the background. Unable to communicate through comms, Dinah calls Sam, instructing him to remain focused. Just the guns, turn around! Stein, something's up. Something's happened to the truck. They were last at Pier 9. I'm heading there. You head for the highway. I'll cut him off. <laughs> you do? 
I knew. Yeah. What did I do? Yeah. You stay out of my way, my daughter. He then departs from the scene, warning Dinah not to interfere with his plans. Frank now possesses the guns, but he remains in the dark about Agent Orange's true identity. To uncover this information, he decides to approach Gunnar Henderson, the man who recorded Zubair's murder. Like Frank in Micro, Gunnar lives in solitude to avoid drawing attention from Agent Orange. Frank locates Gunnar in a forest, and as he explores the area, he is unexpectedly attacked by Gunnar with an arrow. After extracting the arrow, Frank takes cover behind a tree and repeatedly asserts that he is a friend, not an enemy. As Gunnar approaches, Frank surrenders, revealing how he lost his family due to the video Gunnar made. Recognizing his former colleague, Gunnar agrees to engage in a conversation with Frank. When questioned about Agent Orange's identity, Gunnar discloses that he has no information about the agent's real name. During their conversation, the duo hears the approach of a helicopter, and soon, soldiers arrive in the forest. Agent Orange is overseeing the mission, utilizing helmet cameras worn by each soldier. It becomes apparent that ever since becoming the deputy director of the CIA, he has been striving to erase his questionable past. To achieve this, he aims to eliminate everyone who witnessed Zubair's murder at his hands. Okay, Frank, I'm assuming that you and your buddy are the two hiding behind the big tree, yeah? Now they're gonna come up behind you from either side of the tree. <coughs> Downhill. Move. You're gonna die! I'll come for you. But both Frank and Gunner suffer critical injuries. As night falls, Frank continues through the forest, supporting the injured Gunner. Ultimately, succumbing to his wounds, he collapses on the ground. Micro locates him, tends to his injuries, and transports him out of the forest in a van. While Frank is unconscious, he dreams about a family dinner with his own and Micro's family. Welcome home, Frank. Welcome, Welcome home, home, Frank. Oh. Thank you. Hi, right, buddy. No, 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 no! Wait, 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 wait! Just wait! No! Upon waking, Micro tends to Frank's wounds. Micro reveals he's been monitoring radio chatter all day. Someone has been broadcasting Frank's name, referring to him as Raven, a code word Frank's friend Billy used. Although Micro is concerned about Billy knowing Frank is alive, Frank is confident that Billy is unaware. Regardless, Frank believes they shouldn't worry even if Billy does find out. It is because he sees Billy as a close friend and he's convinced they'll go to great lengths to protect each other. Meanwhile, Dinah Madani pays a visit to the location where Gunner met his demise. Micro had notified the local authorities before leaving, ensuring that Gunner's body would be discovered. Although the bodies of the soldiers were removed by their sender, Dinah pieces together the events and suspects that Frank was present with Gunner and likely made the call to the police. Her suspicions are confirmed when Sam informs her that the blood sample found in the area matches Frank's. Now, Dinah is certain that a death squad was dispatched by those who want to keep Mission Cerberus under wraps. It dawns on her that the situation is more dangerous than she initially thought, involving influential figures with the power to deploy a death squad. In her quest to uncover more about Frank, Dinah reaches out to Billy Russo, Frank's friend who owns a private military company. She shares with him the news that Frank is alive, but in critical condition. Since Billy is aware of the Afghanistan case Dinah is pursuing, she seeks Billy's assistance locating Frank, the key witness to the events there. Familiar with the situation, Billy expresses willingness to help find Frank if Dinah's claims are true. Following this, Billy pays a visit to Curtis, a mutual friend of his and Frank's, seeking information on Frank's whereabouts. Curtis pretends to know nothing, Billy then reveals his intention to aid Frank by facilitating his escape from the country and providing him with a new identity for a peaceful life. After Billy departs, Curtis visits Frank and discloses the details of his encounter with Billy. Now believing that Frank should accept the offer, Curtis sees it as an opportunity for Frank to escape Agent Orange's looming threat and embrace a normal life once more. The next day, Frank and Billy reunite at the Riverside, engaging in a conversation after a prolonged separation. Billy shares details about his company and recounts his meeting with Dinah, curious about what Frank knows she doesn't. 
In response, Frank divulges the entire narrative involving Agent Orange, Schoonover, and Bennett trafficking heroin from Afghanistan within the bodies of fallen soldiers. As a true friend, Billy advises Frank to let Dinah pursue her investigation, emphasizing that she shares a common goal of bringing the culprits to justice before parting ways. Billy extends an offer to help Frank leave the city via boat, saying he will wait for him that night. Micro bides his time in his hideout, patiently waiting. Meanwhile, Frank extends his apologies to Sarah for missing the dinner invite. Their conversation takes a heartfelt turn as Sarah confides in Frank about the challenges she faces living without David, particularly the impact on her son Zach. Frank offers words of comfort and motivation witnessing the scene from his hideout, Micro feels distressed for not being there for his family during this difficult period. As night falls, Billy anticipates Frank's arrival at the port, but Frank fails to show up. Disheartened, Billy returns to his car and informs his associate that Frank won't come. Surprisingly, the so-called friend turns out to be Agent Orange. It's revealed that Billy is in league with Agent Orange and wants to see Frank eliminated as soon as possible. The next day, Colonel Bennett, known for smuggling heroin and corpses, finds his dinner interrupted when Frank pays an unexpected visit. Look at the mess you've made. <laughs> we are good. You are clear to proceed. <clears throat> Shut it! Looks like I got here just in time. He's here! Damn it, stop hitting it! How you doing, Frank? More than halfway there. <laughs> Get out of there. Hands up! Kid, I am not your enemy here. I'm gonna go that way. You do what you gotta do. Get on your knees right now! Do it! Kid. No! Try it. The phone cloning is completed, allowing Micro to track Bennett's movements and communications. The duo already knew Agent Orange would send his men to Bennett's house. So basically, they are the ones who outsmarted Agent Orange. The next day, Billy escorts Bennett to Agent Orange's safe house. Fuming with anger, Billy confronts his co-conspirators for using him as bait to lure out Frank. When questioned, Bennett reassures Agent Orange that he hasn't divulged any information to Frank. Realizing Bennett's life is at risk, Agent Orange decides it's time for Bennett to retire. A plan is set in motion to facilitate Bennett's relocation to another country, ensuring Frank won't be able to track him down. As part of the arrangement, Bennett is instructed to leave his phone behind at the safe house. Accompanied by Billy, he departs to start a new life abroad while Micro monitors the phone's location and extracts crucial information about the safe house. You know, since we're being honest, I never much care for you either, Morty. Meanwhile, Dinah is in her office examining the case when a sudden realization hits her. She confides in Sam, expressing her belief that her office is bugged. Connecting the dots, she notes that after they discussed Gunner in her office, he ended up dead the next day. Suspicious, she initiates a search for any surveillance devices in her workspace. Confirming her fears, Dinah discovers a hidden bug on one of her shelves. Despite finding the covert listening device, she opts not to remove it. On another front, Frank arrives outside the safe house, taking aim at Agent Orange. One badge. Two badge. <laughs> Though the attack is a failure, Frank learns the true identity of his target, William Rollins, the director of the CIA's covert operations. The next day, Micro's house experiences a sudden camera outage, prompting Frank to check in and ensure everything is fine. It appears that Sarah intentionally turned off the internet at her house as a lesson for Zach. Once Frank confirms the situation is under control, he prepares to leave. However, as they exchange a farewell embrace, things take an unexpected turn when Sarah attempts to kiss Frank. Caught off guard, Frank stops her advances, creating an awkward moment between them. Micro witnesses the unexpected kiss through the cameras, causing awkward tension between him and Frank. Despite the discomfort, he realizes it wasn't Frank's fault and harbors no grudge against him. Desperate to reunite with his wife, he suggests contacting Dinah Madani, who shares their goal of apprehending the same culprit. 
With the video evidence and an eyewitness, Dinah can arrest Agent Orange, which will allow Micro to return to his family. However, Frank firmly reminds Micro of their agreement, Agent Orange dies at the end. Micro loses control, saying that Frank's family is dead because of him, and now he wants everybody to die. Desperate, Micro attempts to contact Dinah, but is stopped by Frank, who intervenes and renders him unconscious. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dinah and Sam hatch a plan to expose the individuals behind the office bug. They devise a fake tactical plan for a fake weapon heist involving Frank. Obviously, Frank won't be there, but their plan will lure out those responsible for the bug. As anticipated, Billy falls for the trap and meets Agent Orange to discuss their next moves. The decision is made to eliminate Frank on the spot. To execute the job, Billy recruits former contractors from his company, enticing them with the promise of a substantial sum in exchange for successfully carrying out the murder. As predicted by Dinah, Billy and his team fall right into the trap. A fierce shootout erupts between Homeland Security and Billy's crew, with Dinah and Sam also present to apprehend those responsible for the office bug. Homeland Security, drop your weapons! <laughs> Before Dinah arrives, Billy manages to escape, leaving Sam on the floor with his throat slit. On the other hand, we are shown the story of Lewis Wilson, a United States Army veteran grappling with the challenges of reintegrating into civilian life. Upon his return to the United States, he confronted the devastating effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. Struggling with his unstable mental state, he even attempted to harm his own father. In a desperate moment, he tried to take his own life but was unsuccessful coping with his trauma. He chose to sleep in a foxhole he dug in his yard rather than his bed. Seeking a way to channel his military home skills, he enlisted with Billy's private military group Anvil. However, his expectations of securing a position with Anvil were dashed when Billy, aware of his mental struggles, opted not to recruit him. Responding to his father's request, Lewis reluctantly started attending group therapy sessions for military veterans organized by Curtis. During these sessions, he encountered O'Connor, who presented himself as a Vietnam War veteran. However, O'Connor's true agenda was to promote extremist rhetoric. Intrigued by O'Connor's views, Lewis, who already felt rejected by his country, found resonance in the belief that the rules no longer applied and the nation had forsaken the army it had trained. Inspired to make a stand, Lewis joined O'Connor in a protest outside the Bronx County Courthouse. The protest centered around a teacher facing charges for entering his classroom with a revolver. Before long, a police officer named Fahi approached Lewis and O'Connor, questioning their presence and inquiring if they were engaging in a protest. Lewis responded that they were merely distributing pamphlets, asserting it was within their legal rights. When O'Connor gave his explanation for being there, Fahi interpreted it as evidence of a protest and insisted they leave. However, Lewis stood his ground, maintaining that they weren't obstructing anyone from entering the courthouse. He watched as O'Connor left him, and Fahi then shoved him to the ground and arrested him. Lewis delved into O'Connor's military records, discovering that O'Connor never served in the Vietnam War. He confronted O'Connor with the evidence, but the liar denied the accusations, suggesting someone might have tampered with the information. When Lewis refused to accept his story, O'Connor demanded he leave his house, sparking a violent altercation between the two. Faced with the overwhelming events that had unfolded, he resolved to take matters into his own hands. He went to a hardware store and purchased materials to craft homemade bombs. With all preparations in place, Lewis sets off numerous explosives across New York City, targeting a field office, a police station, and the federal courthouse. Amidst the chaos, he sends a letter to Frank's lawyer, Karen. He seeks Karen's help in the letter, believing she can understand his perspective. According to his manifesto, he's defending the liberties of the American people against a government he sees as trying to strip away those rights. As a call to arms, he insists that Karen publish his remarks, otherwise, he will target the New York Bulletin building next time. Disagreeing with his views, Karen opts to address him in an editorial expressing her disgust at his beliefs. Meanwhile, Frank discovers the bombings through the news and reads Karen's response to Lewis. Concerned for Karen's safety, he fears her life may be in danger. 
On the other side, Karen participates in a radio program with Senator Stan Ory to condemn Lewis's actions. Expressing his disappointment, he asks Karen why she spoke negatively about him. In response, Karen explains that she detests everything he has done. While listening to Karen condemn his actions, Lewis declares that she and Ori are on the wrong side of the war. He ends the call. Realizing that Karen's life is in jeopardy, Frank instructs Micro to track down Lewis. Micro is puzzled about why Frank is focusing on this case instead of their own. Frank then reveals that Karen is like his family and he can't bear to lose her. Aware that Lewis poses a threat to Karen, Frank loses control and demands that Micro locate Lewis as soon as possible. In the meantime, Curtis heads to O'Connor's house as he hasn't heard from him in days. Upon arrival, he discovers the door locked and a smell coming from inside. Upon entering, he stumbles upon O'Connor's lifeless body on a sofa, right where Lewis had left him. Lewis suddenly appears and launches an attack. It's not too late to do the right thing. I am doing the right thing. I can't leave here without you, buddy. I can't leave here. Shortly after, Frank arrives and finds Curtis tied to a chair with a bomb strapped to his chest. As Lewis dials Curtis's phone, Frank answers and initiates a psychological game with him. Standing outside the house, Lewis expresses admiration for Frank's actions and desires to take matters into his own hands, similar to Frank's. He informs Frank that he's called the cops but doesn't want Frank to die, suggesting that they should be allies. Frank agrees, and in return, Lewis provides the information on which wire to cut to defuse the bomb. As the police arrive, Frank takes quick action. He hurls a stone, incapacitating one officer and swiftly subduing the other. Seizing the opportunity, he makes his escape, leaving the scene in a stolen police car. However, upon returning to the hideout, Frank discovers that his identity has been exposed to the entire United States due to the police dashcam footage. Now, he is being labeled a terrorist and held responsible for all the bombings. The following day, while Karen interviews Ori, an explosion at the door sends them both flying to the floor. Smoke fills the room as Lewis and Frank start taking down the guards. Despite being injured, Ori manages to get up, seize his pistol, and fire at Lewis while making his escape. Karen is left alone with Lewis. This is the account Senator Ori provides to Detective Sergeant Brett Mahoney. However, Karen refutes his claims, stating it's not what actually transpired. She then recounts the actual events that unfolded. Lewis entered the room wielding a pistol, ruthlessly taking down everyone in his path. Senator Ori attempted to flee, but Lewis apprehended him at gunpoint. Just as Lewis was about to execute them both, Frank suddenly appeared, leaping in front of Karen to take the shot. But Lewis revealed he was holding a bomb with a single button in his hand capable of detonating it. Upon reaching the corridor, Frank and the security guards are compelled to surrender while Lewis takes the elevator. A skirmish ensues between Frank and the security personnel. The other half of the story is narrated by Dinah. A day earlier, she discovered that the individuals who attempted to kill Frank on the day of Sam's death were all linked to Billy's company at some point. Suspecting Billy of possibly installing the bug in her office, she confronted him to inquire about his intentions. Billy acknowledged the identity of the deceased man, but asserted that they were all former employees of his company, implying the company no longer had any association with them. As Billy denied the accusations, the alarm rang due to the ongoing attack. Everyone suspected Frank as the culprit, but Dinah was convinced of his innocence. She took the stairs and eventually found Frank. She suggested they team up to expose Agent Orange, but Frank insisted on dealing with him himself. Amid their conversation, Frank gets shot by his best friend, Billy. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lewis had taken Karen to the kitchen where he threatened to detonate the bomb. Frank soon joined them, prompting Lewis to use Karen as a hostage. I'm on off. Hey! I'm on off. Stay back. Take one more step. We were with Curtis. You told me to pull that white wire. You did the right thing, kid. He's just gonna give up. You and me, we are the same. We're creatures of habit, Lewis. Right? We like to do the same thing over and over and over again. No! No! We gotta go. We gotta go now. Karen, get out of here. Go like a soldier. 
Karen and Frank narrowly escape the door just before it crashes to the floor. On the other side, a police officer arrives at Sarah's house in response to a call claiming information about Frank. It turns out Zach, after seeing Frank's identity on the news, called the cops to report his frequent visits. When questioned, Sarah downplays it as a possible misunderstanding. When the officer informs Sarah that they need to go to the police station, she senses something is wrong, suspecting trouble. She instructs Zach to run, and at that moment, the officer reveals his true intentions as he chases after the mother and son. Unaware of the events unfolding in his house, Micro tunes into the news where Billy portrays Frank as a terrorist. When Frank observes signs of a struggle in Micro's house, they review the footage and discover the abduction of Sarah and Zach. In a sudden realization, Frank understands that their hideout's location is now compromised since Sarah has his number, making it easier for Billy to track them down. Anticipating the imminent showdown, Frank meticulously prepares. He strategically places guns in various locations, loads his weapons, dons a bulletproof jacket, and awaits the arrival of the enemies. After neutralizing all the mercenaries, Frank uses their phones to contact Billy. Billy informs him that Sarah and Zack are in their custody and proposes a deal. If Frank and Micro want to free them, they must surrender. The exchange is set to take place the next day. Later, Frank joins Dinah, Micro, and Leo who has now reunited with her father after successfully evading capture by the cops. Having learned that Micro allowed Dinah in, Frank decides to place his trust in her. The next day, the exchange takes place. Zack and Sarah are compelled to wear fuel containers that have been cut and are leaking. Sarah walks hesitantly towards Frank and Micro, struggling to believe her husband is alive. Simultaneously, Frank maintains contact with Billy, who has his sniper aimed at him, leaving no room for double-crossing. Billy's men ignite the fuel, prompting Micro to remove his jacket and use it to extinguish the flames. Homeland Security arrives at the location, but before they can intervene, Frank is caught and knocked unconscious. Tragically, Micro becomes a victim of a bullet from Homeland Security. As he succumbs to death, Sarah screams in pain, covering her son's eyes to spare him from witnessing his father's brutal end. The traumatic loss of her husband is relived once again. Micro's body is transported to the Homeland Security Building, where it is revealed that he is still alive. It turns out his survival was part of their orchestrated plan. Frank was supposed to assist Dinah in apprehending the culprits, but he went unconscious, disrupting their strategy. It appears he might have done it intentionally to prevent the criminals from being arrested. He wanted to ensure they face his own form of justice, which is death. Despite the setback, Micro is eventually reunited with his family, sharing a heartfelt embrace. On the other side, Billy has brought Frank to his hideout, where Agent Orange has joined them. Restrained to a chair, Frank asserts that he will eliminate all of them. A computer specialist is summoned to erase everything from Micro's computer. Meanwhile, Micro discloses Frank's true plan to Dinah. He reveals that Frank is driven by the desire to eliminate these individuals, and they had an agreement. Micro promised to give Frank the chance to kill them, anticipating that Billy would take Frank to their hideout. They knew they needed Frank to access the computers with his retinal scan since Micro was no longer there. Utilizing Dinah's computer, Micro gains access to the cameras at the hideout. They witness Frank enduring a brutal beating from Agent Orange. Micro explains that it was all part of Frank's strategy. Micro urges Dinah to assist Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up and I'll make it clean and fast. Go out like a soldier. It's a retinal scan and a keystroke. My, my eye, my right hand. That guy was good. We were never getting in here without the codes. 
The backup systems and security are gnarly. You're good! You are nothing but a smart fear, Frank. Rips! Must be close! This doesn't serve me! Billy, don't get confused. Men like me make the plans. Men like you shed the blood. Adrenaline. You wrong. God damn, Frankie. I love to watch you work. Who's those injured but armed? Search every area. Frank survives, but Billy manages to escape. After tending to his wounds, Billy heads to his office to retrieve money and a passport. While Homeland Security raids his office, he attacks them from behind. He eliminates the remaining team members and escapes the building. As he departs, he presses a button that triggers a bomb in his office, causing a powerful explosion. Frank's life is saved thanks to the surgical skills of Dinah's father. In gratitude, Micro gives Frank money acquired from the enemy's accounts. Micro and Dinah counsel Frank to leave the country and seek a peaceful life elsewhere. On that same day, as Curtis sleeps, an unwelcome visitor arrives at his house, brandishing a gun. It turns out to be his best friend, Billy, seeking information on Frank's whereabouts. When Curtis admits to knowing that Frank is alive, Billy is hurt, unable to reconcile the betrayal from one friend trying to kill him and another lying to him all this time. Amidst their conversation, a bullet pierces the building, narrowly missing Billy. In retaliation for the betrayal, Billy shoots at Curtis, injuring his shoulder. As it unfolds, Frank is positioned on the adjacent building, patiently awaiting Billy to appear in the window so he can exact his revenge. Billy attempts to rise, but the moment his knife becomes visible to Frank, a shot is fired, forcing him to remain where he is. Frank contacts Curtis and instructs him to put Billy on the phone. When Billy takes the phone, Frank warns him not to harm Curtis. A decision is made to meet at their usual gathering place, the park where they used to spend time together as a family. Frank decides to let Billy go, allowing him to arrive at the park, where he takes two employees hostage. As Frank approaches the location, he discovers two teenagers tied to the horses of a running carousel, initially distracting Billy by firing in the opposite direction. Frank enters the park from another angle and launches an attack. I never had anybody. Frank refrains from killing him as he believes inflicting severe pain and leaving scars on his body will haunt Billy for the rest of his life. Dinah is rescued and Frank, despite his actions, is arrested. However, he is granted freedom and a new identity in exchange for not exposing the case. On the other hand, Billy has endured numerous rounds of surgery, his face now concealed by multiple layers of gauze. The doctors are unsure if he will suffer brain damage or even memory loss and this is where the season one ends. Did you like our movie recap? Please subscribe and comment to help us do more videos. See you next time.